Welcome to the Curious About Nature podcast. This week, I'm joined by Emma Hewlett, who's a copy editor for businesses that make a difference. Emma spent a whole year living in her family's van, volunteering and living on small holdings across Europe. Hi, Emma. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's really lovely to see you again. What were your reasons then for spending a year living in your family's van? My husband and I were both in stressful jobs, teacher, social worker, just looking for a different way to live. I can't actually remember how it all evolved. I think initially I was going to teach English in Spain and then it just evolved. And we decided we wanted to be on the land, got a very rusty van, took the kids out of school, rented the house out, quit the jobs and went. Yeah, it was a big leap. <laughs> but yeah, it was definitely worth it. Yeah. So whereabouts did you go first then? So we started in northern France. My in-laws lived there. So we sort of tested the van out and made sure we could all fit and live in a small space together. And then we travelled down through France, through the French Pyrenees, across to Valencia, down the east coast of Spain, Andalusia, and then up to Extremadura, which was a lovely, very non-touristy place. And then over into Portugal. And there, well, our journey had to end a little bit early because of COVID. But yeah, so it would have been a longer, we would have worked our way back up again. But yeah, so France, Spain and Portugal. Was it always the intention to make it a year only or did you come back because of COVID? I think we kind of left it fairly open-ended. We were thinking a year-ish, but semi-open-minded to the fact it could go on for two years but I think actually part way through I was thinking a year probably is enough for me actually I wanted to be back with the family and, and things like that but Covid yeah Covid and a really dodgy van <laughs> <laughs> being isolated with no toilet shower even water just meant actually we had to end it earlier than planned but we'll go back and finish it hopefully yeah well, sounds, sounds really wonderful I imagine it was a great experience for you and your family what did yeah. you do whilst you were away then? So we volunteered. Generally, we swapped about five hours work a day for bed and board or land to park our van on and board. And we worked whatever was needed doing. So there was a lot of looking after chickens, a lot of a lot of cutting brambles back and rescuing orange trees and just vegetation. We looked after dogs, lots of planting veggies. Crikey, I can't even remember now. <laughs> we lived on a mountain. We, we chopped trees down. We chopped lots of firewood, built A-frame veggie plots with the kids. We dug, have you ever seen one of those herb spiral gardens? Yes, things? yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, anything that needed doing. Some of it was just odd jobs, like helping people to winterproof their mountain properties. What else? Fixing a pool side. Just random, really random. But everyone was just so welcoming and just had loads for us to do. But it was lovely and the kids worked alongside us. So it was quite nice. We got the work done early in the morning and then we had the afternoon just to be with them, mm. which was a really nice way. Five, five, day, five hours a day is just such a nice length. <laughs> yeah. How, how old were your children at the time? But so my youngest had just turned three and my eldest was five. So we took my eldest out. So he missed year one in school which was, I mean, it was ideal. So we had full intentions of homeschooling or road schooling, whatever you want to call it. And we kind of went out the window a little bit, like any formal form mm. of schooling, because we quite quickly realised that they learn when they want to learn. <laughs> and it's not much fun schooling your own children, as many people found out last year. So actually they learned so much more just alongside us, like collecting olives, collecting oranges. And there was a lot of harvesting. We incorporated that with maths and just life skills so many life skills yeah mm. yeah it was great <laughs> so what what did you enjoy the most the freedom the freedom like apart from the hours of work which generally I mean there's no contract so it was flexible and everyone was very understanding that we had children we generally stayed with people that were families anyway so our kids would go and play with theirs or it was just really fluid but aside from that it was the freedom to be wherever we wanted to be to stop wherever we wanted to stop for the night we did some wild camping and I think all being in a van as well you could just stop anywhere yeah so the freedom and not having the responsibilities of bills and mortgages and everything back home it was just yeah releasing the shackles I think and just exploring other ways that people lived 
for most of the people that we were with, they were off grid and they weren't working, weren't in paid employment, but they were they were living life. Mm. It felt like actual living rather than just living to work. Yeah. So yeah, that was the best thing, I think. What was maybe the least enjoyable part of the experience? <laughs> toileting in a van um we had to we were toilet training my youngest who had toileting issues with my eldest we didn't have a toilet in our van not a proper one so and like just chopping and changing and getting into new routines with new people every couple of weeks every two or three weeks we were moving which was fine so we've they've learned a lot about grief and moving on and you know detaching from people so that we're all quite resilient now but there's always that transition few days where you're like okay where do they keep this what are the rules where can I sleep how much noise can we make so yeah the, the toileting and the adjustment I think to different people and places mm. did you make some friends whilst you were on the road yeah yeah we did most of the places that we stayed they had children there were a couple that didn't but they were an older couple and they, they they actually became like grandparents to the kids they just clung to them it was brilliant they had a great time yeah, so there was there was a lot of people on the road. We met a few families in between placements. We tried to every now and again have a week or so where it was just the four of us on the road, kind of recovering a little bit because it can be quite intense living in someone else's pockets for you know sometimes a month at a time. Mm -hmm. So the the kids, yeah, the boys, they they met other people. Although the language barriers were sometimes difficult, mm -hmm. they weren't confident enough to speak to the children in other languages. So that wasn't always so easy, but. Yeah, they were fine. They had each other. So how, how did you find these places to go and work then? How did you come across them? So we used three different websites. So we had HelpX, Workaway and Woofing. You put your profiles on there and then you can search for the type of work you want to do, availability, and the region that you want to stay in. And then you can make contact with them, just have a conversation beforehand. Is this the kind of thing that they're open to? It was easier in a way for us because we're very specific because not everyone had space for a family of four so that narrowed our searches down quite a lot we were quite flexible about what work we did and we just contacted them had a conversation a couple of them we had a phone call and left it that it did mean that often you didn't get any responses you know it's like when you ping an email a mass email out so I'd send maybe 15 emails and get two back which was always a bit you know, it was a little bit more difficult. Christmas was the most difficult time trying to find someone, actually. But we ended up staying with a British woman who was in the south of Spain near Granada. She was trying to get into equine therapy for children and for people fleeing domestic abuse over the border. And she just needed someone to help with her very unruly, badly behaved dogs and muck out her pony and just anything else that needed doing. And she put us up in her friend's flat for a reduced price over Christmas. And then we went from luxury to like the complete opposite a week after the Christmas period where we were just staying in a very leaky one bedroom bunk bed with the four of us. That was a challenging one, but it was still, we learned a lot. But yeah, so it was the three websites. So we usually planned it a couple of weeks in advance. So we knew where we were going and could prepare the kids. Yeah, so it sounds like a real great experience for connecting your family to nature. How did that nature connection impact your family, do you think? I think we're just a lot more aware of our impact because most of the time we were living in the fields. We were eating and growing everything where we were living. In some cases, we were using the water from the well to wash. We used our solar shower as well. So we were just aware that anything that we were using on our bodies, doing our washing up, was going straight into the soil. And learning from other people who lived in even more rural communities where they didn't even have rubbish collection. So they had to be aware that everything they use, they have to dig a hole and put it in the ground, like on their land. And it just opens your eyes a little bit when you're living that close to nature. So yeah, we've just become more mindful, I think, of how we live and what we waste and how we can use the natural resources to function. We don't have to go out and buy everything. Like everything is here if we need it, we just need to be creative. So how did that experience change your family life? We're a lot closer, actually. 
lots of people would find it challenging. There were challenges living in <laughs> six foot, not even square um, van with each other, but you live through each other's challenges, emotional ups and downs. So we're we're all very honest with each other, very much in touch with each other's feelings. And we're a team. I would say we're definitely a team. And we're quite happy to just be outside. We spend an awful lot of time just eating outside. And it was only when we came back from our adventure, we realised how little people seem to use their gardens. As soon as April, I suppose, we have not breakfast yet, but we have lunch and dinner outside. You know, it doesn't even have to be sunny. We just want to be out there. And just how restorative it is being outside as well. We can all be having a bit of a Barney or a grumpy day, but step out into the woods. And it's like this wave of calm comes over us a little bit more playful. It's, yeah, lots of ways it's impacted us. <laughs> yeah, no. It is amazing, isn't it? Just just stepping away for a moment from each other, you know, and having that open space. It, yeah. it can make a huge difference. Do you have any tips for anybody else that maybe wants to go traveling with their family, maybe choose something, whether it's a, you know, holiday vacation or whether it's working the land? What would your top tips be? I think go for it. Just go for it. I think there's always a reason to scare yourself away from it. And I know before we went, we wrote a whole list of reasons not to do the adventure. But at the end of the day, nothing's going to be perfect. And it just, it, it was so much more enriching than we ever anticipated. And we learned a lot about, like people generally, their default is to be kind and generous and to want to help. And I think we've, we've kind of lost that a little bit over here. Do some research, but don't overthink it. What else would I advise? Just to let your kids take the lead as well. If you're out in nature, just trust that they're fine. I know we can be really obsessed with health and safety and danger. And of course, as parents, we're all worried about our kids hurting themselves. But actually, they're physically able. And it's okay to let them go out and have a wander around a field. As long as you know there aren't any open wells and things, just do it. Just like, yeah, ignore the fear and go for it is my biggest bit of advice. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just about to ask you, have you got any tips for that kind of rewilding childhood and letting children be a bit more feral? Mm. You've sort of touched on that. And yeah. I think sometimes uh, we kind of become slightly overprotective maybe when, yeah. you know, even in our own back gardens, for instance. And it's- Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, we've literally just moved house and I don't think many people wanted the house that we bought because it's, it's semi-rural Devon and everything's a bit, quirky the way the land is owned so our garden is actually about 50 meters from our back door our garden overlooks our next door neighbors so we have to walk through and then the garden's at the back which for us is fine if we'd bought this place before we went on our adventures we'd have been oh I don't know that we can't hear the kids they're out of earshot can't see what they're doing but since then like it doesn't matter. Like we're used to being a couple of fields away from our kids. Like we developed, we've got our family call, which I'm not going to do yeah. because it's loud, <laughs> but that was unique to us and that meant, okay, you absolutely have to pay attention or I really need help and we're there. Yeah. There is a lot of overcautious parenting out there, which is a shame because I think it, there's so much more to experience just by breathing and just trusting each other that actually it will be all right yeah yeah I, th I think we've got possibly understandably I don't know we got so wrapped up in stranger danger haven't we that yeah we've forgotten how to live a little bit with our yes. kids and me yeah. yeah yeah and actually I think uh, yeah the stranger danger thing it's like it's teaching children not to say hello to strangers as well and actually so much good can come from that and that was a big thing I, I did mention it earlier but about just realizing that by default, people are generous and kind and really nourishing to be around. And when we came back from the travels, I was much more willing to speak to people and just random people, which is more accepted down here in Devon than it was back in Hampshire, which is quite nice. But yeah, we've become quite disconnected from each other and nature. And our adventure has definitely, it's made us relax those barriers, I think. Yeah. So if I wanted to be a little bit more relaxed, how would I maybe go about doing that? If anybody's listening and still thinking, oh, this is a bit much, I, you know, that sounds bite a bit too feral. <laughs> <laughs> bite, bite your tongue. 
let the kids have a wee in a garden like it's fine let them climb that rock you know explain to them what they might be need to think about but generally their bodies will tell them when they're you know I'm generalizing there are some children that you know maybe aren't able to assess that risk but generally their bodies will be able to tell them whether they can do something it's how we learn isn't it and it's good to get grubby I volunteer with the Devon Wildlife Trust I go and I water the plants at the nursery and she says I have to say this because it's health and safety but wash your hands because you know you've been touching soil and I was thinking well it's just, it's just mud like soil's pretty nutritious right can't be too much bad in there so but it's those things isn't it you have to be constantly clean and actually no it's fine just be grubby and have fun just let the kids use their imagination and run wild for a little bit yeah I was going to ask you if your family is still involved in like working the lands but it sounds like you're you're still trying to keep those connections going as much as we can yeah it's easier now that we've moved down to Devon the kind of people that we wanted to connect with there mm. it's easier to find them down here so we had an allotment at our previous home but they only have 10 available here which is very small but we've been planting i've been out there on a slug patrol obsessively and my youngest especially he's keen to just go straight out there he's got his own strawberry plants and tomato plants and just constantly wants to be out there we've got slow worms nesting in our compost bin we do a bit of foraging just like amateur my kids recognize certain things and they know certain trees and birds and there's a natural curiosity and just comfort actually with being outside a little bit yeah so we tried to be involved and there's a lot more going on here as well so i've got the the tree nurseries down the road and dartmoor across the way so yeah we try to get involved as much as we can definitely do you think it's had a, a positive impact then on your family do you sort of see your kids maybe not necessarily going into careers in conservation or anything like that but do you think this will become a, a sort of permanent life philosophy in keeping that connection going I think that's what my husband and I would like to do. <laughs> I think what it has done, it's having that year back from the system and all of us just being in touch with what we enjoy doing most. It's certainly highlighted maybe the skills and interests of our children a little bit more. So my youngest, we know that he really is very fond of animals and very much drawn to nature. My eldest, possibly not so much like he has an interest but i think despite the year away he would still rather sit in front of a screen although we limit that a lot but i think if there's a screen there he'll definitely i think reject the stuff we've been teaching him all this time and you know just go for technology but so i think there's only so much you can do you can't ram it down their throats can you but i think it's given us all the time to realize how we would like to live our lives a little bit more so what's next for yourself, your family and, and your business life? Because you're working with companies that are trying to make a difference as well. Crikey. So, yeah, I mean, that was part of the connection. I became a, a copy editor as a result of being on the road and wanting to um, free up our space for more travel. And it's something I could do on the road. And the way that I could make that most nourishing and feed my eco warrior anxiety <laughs> was to work with businesses who have got a really important message to get out there so that will continue and that continues to grow my husband is working his way out of education and very open to opportunities where he's using his hands more and he's in nature in terms of as a family we, we want to go on another adventure but i feel a bit mean after we've just moved the boys down to Devon, <laughs> like going again but we have said that we will go to rural Italy next year, but we're not sure what that will look like. Because we sadly had to sell Betsy of, they're so expensive now to have vans, but we have bought Daisy, our bell tent. So we do plan on spending more time camping. Like mm -hmm. Nature will be in there somewhere, but I don't know what it looks like just yet, but it's a journey. I think that's the big thing we've learned. We don't have to aim for perfection. This is all a journey and opportunities arise at the right time when you're with the right people it's, it's massively our adventure has massively changed our philosophy i sound like a hippie but it's massively changed our philosophy <laughs> on everything yeah so yeah things will happen when they're meant to happen yeah no that that's a good way to look at it and i, I think it's great that your kids have had this experience and it will be interesting to see how your life in devon will be mm. different to your previous family life as well i i completely you know, understand what you mean about children. My daughter 
is a, a TV and app addict. And <laughs> <laughs> that's part of the reason I developed Buttercup. It was looking at her and going, I want to get you outside more, come away from the tech. And we're a tech enabled family. I get that because I'm, you know, working in animation, but I really wants to sort of give her that that experience but we still haven't got past the oh soil is horrible kind of like don't like get my hands dirty you know we've tried lots of different gloves for her and we're yeah yeah we're, we're going to try and find a brand that she likes so you know don't have nasty seams in them they feel comfortable and then i think yeah. she'll get her hands in there whereas i'm not bothered i have to get my hands in don't need gloves yeah but, um, quite... maybe leave them to do the watering yes. rather than the yeah soil contact stuff yeah so she'll drop the seed in and let somebody else touch it and she loves being in a hammock outside making up stories and just sitting there and chilling and and blowing dandelions everywhere and things like that Perfect. so uh, so she will go out but there are so many other kids i think who probably have a similar perspective on it that you know they love learning about nature facts but mm. keep me away from the soil <laughs> but i think that's fine isn't it i think we've all got to connect with nature in our own way and yeah. this is I, I wrote a blog post about this not so long ago where we can't ram this being green saving the planet idea down everyone's throat because it's just not going to resonate no. with everyone and if it means that you're outside but you're listening to your podcast or your music yeah. through your headphones who cares? Like you can still see the beauty. You can still feel the fresh air, can't you? And yeah, it can be done in so many different ways. And I think if your child is attracted to technology, great. I mean, use that to learn about nature, which people can do beautifully with your product. So yeah, you need to speak to people in the right way, don't you? Yeah. And I, I think it is about, like you said, it com comes from the individual, whether you're an adult or a child, you know how you want to interact with other people and nature. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So any final tips for anybody else who's uh, going to go and volunteer on small holdings in the next year, Emma? Anything you wish oh, you'd God, done differently, think... maybe? Probably not got so bogged down in, oh, am I doing enough work for the person? I think that was always, because everyone was so relaxed, actually, it was more about the experience. So maybe diving into the experience and absorbing the lifestyle a little bit more rather than, oh, crikey I'm painting their house <laughs> um I should really really work hard on this and it needs to be perfect because they actually don't expect that <laughs> so just relax a little bit more I think is my motto to be honest because I'm not always relaxed <laughs> do it and enjoy it just see where it takes you I think that's a brilliant way to end this actually isn't it just get out in nature relax enjoy yes. it so whether you're working volunteering or playing with your kids just go and do it and That's have some it. fun Absolutely. thank you so much for joining us emma where can we find you online if we want to find out more about your business journey or what you're up to or just follow you on social where can we find yes. you so i'm on linkedin emma hewlett and you can also find me at emma h proofreading on instagram thank you very much for having me rachel it's, it's been lovely uh, it's been lovely to talk to you again so take care emma and you bye